Okay, we're going to continue on with chapter 14. In verse 1. So Abijah slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa his son reigned in his stead. In his days the land was quiet ten years. Verse 2. And Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. For he took away the altars of the strange gods in the high places, and break down the images, and cut down the groves. He just didn't say he was a believer. He showed them with his works. He showed he was a believer of God by his works. Not that work saves you. We know that. Works do not save you. But when you're born again, you will have works. You will show that you're obeying the Lord God and his instructions that he has in the Bible. And by, by obeying God, this is, this is what he did. By obeying God, he did what it says in Deuteronomy 12, verses 2 and 3. Ye shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods, and upon the high mountains, and upon the hills, and under every green tree. And ye shall overthrow their altars, and break their pillars, and burn their groves with fire. And ye shall hew down the graven images of their gods, and destroy the name of them out of that place. And we already know, you know, statues is not the way to go. This is against God's will. This says it right here. He doesn't want no graven images, which is mainly statues. Now, some people, now this is just for some people, not many, but some people, they have pictures. Now, if you worship, if you bow down to that picture and pray to that person on the, pers on the picture, that's wrong. There's nothing that we should have as an image of a worship to whatever it is. It's against God's laws. Verse 4. And commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to do the law and the commandments. When a man, when a man of God is put as the head of whatever, his house, uh, the country, whatever, whatever man of God is, whatever he's put over, his responsibility is to command. Now, you think, well, that's pretty strong command. Well, yes. Uh, he is the head of the house, or if he's the head of a nation, yes, he makes commands. This is what we're going to do here. This is the way we're going to do it. And if the people or whoever lives in your house doesn't like it, and it's the way of the Lord, then they can leave. I know that sounds harsh, but this is the way the Lord, the Lord has it. Nothing, nobody comes before God. If somebody in your family, no matter who it is, does not want to obey the commands of the head of the house, then they are to be kicked out. Just like in the church, if a brother, and I'm saying a brother, has backslidden and he's in the flesh, walking in the flesh, and he doesn't want to repent, well, the church, the Lord says the church can kick him out. It's biblical. Make sure we see the word do. Many of us fail at that. We hear but we don't do. I heard you hear you heard me on that. We hear it. We hear our preacher, we hear the teacher, we hear what they say, but we're not doers. Many of us are that way. We need to be doers of the word. That's why he did up here. He didn't just said he believed in God. He showed it by the, by getting rid of what was against God. Now Asa, he's not a president. Okay, he's not a, our president now. He has to go through the house, through Senate, through. I mean, he's got to go through all kind of stuff if he wants to get something done. But he, uh, Asa was a king, and you better obey a king, because a king is king. His word is final. If he says put that man to death, he's put to death. No questions asked. If he says I want this done, it's done. No questions asked. A king has the final demand. Nobody questions a king. Not back then. Because if you did, watch out. As we see that the Lord's that the Lord doesn't tolerate religious views. It's his way or it's the highway. That's the way the Lord puts it. Do it my way or go your own way. Exodus twenty two twenty. 
He that sanctifieth unto any God, except unto the Lord only, he shall be utterly destroyed. Now this is the word of God I'm reading you. This is the scriptures. You can ignore them, or you can accept them and believe them. Verse 5. Also he took away uh, of all of the cities of Judah, the high places and the images, and the kingdom was quiet before him. And he built fence cities in Judah, for the land had rest, and he had no war in those years, because the Lord had given him rest. As being head, he took away their shrines, their statues. I hope you heard that. He took away what wasn't of God. Again, I'm saying, because he did those things, God gave him and his nation rest. Because they followed the Lord, he gave them rest. When you follow the Lord, that's what you get, is rest. You have peace and rest in the Lord. That's what he gives us when we obey him. Verse 7, Therefore he said unto Judah, Let us build these cities, and make about them walls and towers, gates and bars, while the land is yet before us, because we have sought the Lord our God. We have sought him, and he hath given us rest on every side, so they built and prospered. This is what happens when you're living for the Lord. You prosper. When you're living for the Lord, you prosper. You might not have much, but you are prospering. Hope you understand what I'm saying. You do prosper when you live for the Lord. And it might not be material things. It might be rewards. You know, you get rewards from the Lord, that's prospering. I'm not saying it was perfect. I'm sure they had some problems. But they gave them to the Lord. They weren't a perfect nation. Like I said. I'm sure they had some problems. But they took it to the Lord. And he took care of them. Verse 8. And Asa had an army of men that bare targets and spears. Out of Judah 300,000. And out of Benjamin that bare shields and and drew bows two hundred and fourscore thousand. All these were mighty men of valor. Nowadays we have armies, and and not every man in that that's in the army or whatever service you're in, not every man in there. I hate to say it, but not every man in there is a brave soldier. But God said right here that these five hundred and eighty thousand men were all men of valor. These were all. John Wayne's. Those of you who remember John Wayne, you know, he, he could go up against an army by himself and win. But anyway, that's how good they were. He had a pretty good army with that many men that were mighty. Verse 9, And there came against them Zerod, the Ethiopian, with a host of a thousand thousand and three hundred chariots, and came unto him Mehaja. Now, this was a million men Right here in verse 9. This is a million men. In verse 10. Then Asa went out against him. And they set the battle in array. In the valley of Zephazah. At Merasha. This man of God Asa. When he saw a million men. Up against just his 580,000. Was he was almost outnumbered. Two to one. Did he run? When we see a, a big problem come our way, a big one, and we're like, we look at it and we're like, oh my gosh, what do we do? Do we run? We shouldn't run. If we're Christians, we shouldn't. Asa here was a man of God. Let's see what he did. Verse 11. And Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help. Asa was saying, Lord, <laughs> It could be two million out there, and it's, that's nothing for the Lord to take care of. We need to believe that. No matter how big the problem is we go up against, no matter how big it is, with the Lord, nothing is impossible. And it says, whether with many or with them that have no power, help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on Thee. Amen. We rest on Thee. Oh my gosh, how we can learn. How we can learn to rest on the Lord, we would be doing away with this depression, ulcers, sadness, 
if we would only rest on the Lord. And it says, In thy name we will go against this multitude, O Lord. Thou art our God. Let not men prevail against thee. Now I would say this is a pretty good, pretty spiritual prayer. He cried out unto the Lord. That's what we do. We cry out to the Lord. And says there's nothing he can't handle. Which is true. We know that. And just like the Lord's Prayer in Matthew's. The Lord's Prayer in Matthew starts off by praising God. And this is what he did. He's, he, was, he was praising God. Then he tells God, we trust in you. Amen. God. Man, let us learn from this prayer. We, he trusted in God. He's going up against a million men and he trusted in God. We trust in you. And he says, we're going in the power of your name. Well, you have God. God, the name of God. Jehovah is in you. And that's who you have fighting your battles. Should we worry about anything? Really, think about it. Should we? When God Almighty, the only true God, is on our side? Abijah did the same thing. He cried out to the Lord. But as the Lord answered his prayers, like I said last week, he answered his prayers. But he answered his prayers not for Abijah. But he answered them because for David's sake, it said, and for to establish Jerusalem. Those are the two reasons he answered a wicked man's prayer. We're going to see that he answered Asa's prayer, but for different reasons. He says, Asa says, Oh Lord, you are our God. This is why God answers prayer. That's why he answered his prayer. Because Asa really lived for the Lord. Like I said, he was going against a million men. It really doesn't look good. But who was he depending on? Do we really live like God is in charge of our life? Do we? Do we live that way? No matter what comes against us. It could be a million men. No matter what comes up against us. No matter how big. Are we depending on the Lord to take care of it? Man cannot come up against you. Because you have the Lord God. We have the Lord God. Now let's see what happened when he trusted in the Lord. When you trust in the Lord, let's see what he can do. Verse 12. So the Lord smoked the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah. And the Ethiopians fled. And Asa and the people that were with him pursued them unto Gera. And the Ethiopians were overthrown that they could not recover themselves. For they were destroyed before the Lord and before his host. And they carried away very much spoil. And they smoked all the cities round about Gera, for the fear of the Lord came upon them, and they spoiled all the cities, for there was exceeding much spoil in them. They smoked also the tents of cattle, and carried away sheep and camels in abundance, and returned to Jerusalem. Now this ain't no fairy tale story. This is true. This is what really happened. And this is what the Lord can do in your life if we let him. The big thing is if we let him. Chapter 15. And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. And he went out to meet Azariah, I mean Asa, and said unto him, Hear you me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you be with him, and if you seek him, he will be found of you. But if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. Azariah went out to meet King Asa as he was returning from this battle. His, this great victory he had. And he says to him, listen to me, Asa. And he shouted to all the people so they could hear. The Lord will stay with you as long as you stay with him. Whenever you seek him, you will find him. But if you leave him... He will no longer protect you. This is what he's saying right here. God sent Ezra to warn Asa after he had this great victory. Why do you think God did that? He did it because there's a lot of times when we overcome a, a, a great battle in our life or whatever the problem is. A lot of times when we overcome it, not us, but the Lord. But after, after we go through something like that, sometimes 
Pride sets in. Look, look what I overcame. Pride comes in. And the Lord was warning Asa, hey, don't get puffed up in pride because you, you won this battle. That's what they're saying. Well, this is what he's warning them of. Verse 3. Now for a long season, Israel had been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. But, but when they in their trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found of them. And when they were in trouble, they repented of their backsliding and they sought the Lord and he was there to receive them back. When things are going good, we, we, we don't really look at the Lord. Everything's fine. You know, we really don't seek the Lord. You know, things are good. But as soon as a problem comes along, as soon as trouble comes along, what do we do? Oh God, oh my God, help me. You know, every day is the Lord's day, every day. Not just when you get in trouble, not just at Easter, not just at Christmas, not just on Sunday. Every day is the Lord. Every day we should seek the Lord, not only when we're in trouble. Remember that. Every day is the Lord's day. Verse 5. In those times there was no peace to him that went out, nor to him that came in. But great vexation were upon all the inhabitants of the countries. When Israel was not walking with the Lord, whether in battle, in a war, or just living life, they found themselves in trouble all the time because they were in darkness. This is what happens when you're not walking with the Lord. Verse 6. And nation was destroyed of nation and city of city, for God did vex them with all adversity. It says that God allowed all these troubles to come, on, uh, come upon them. God allowed it. You're not walking with him. If you're not seeking him, God allows these things to happen to you. Because God's, God's in control of everything. Everything. Whatever is happening to you, God has allowed it to happen to you. Whether it be for good or for bad, God is in control. Many of us have to learn that. He is in control. Verse 7, Be ye strong, therefore, and let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. He's telling Judah to stay strong in him, and he will reward them. Amen? He will. When you're staying strong in the Lord, he will reward us. Either he'll reward us now while we're living, or he'll reward us in heaven. Either way, we're going to get a reward when we walk with the Lord and we stay strong in him. Verse 8, and when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin and out of the cities <clears throat> which he had taken from Mount Ephraim. And he renewed the altars of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. Now when the Lord gives us a word of encouragement, when he gives a word of encouragement, that should revive us. That should put a spark in us to, to, to get even closer to him. To even want him more. The word right here was renew. When we get a word of encouragement, that's, that's like renewing us, reviving us. Making us fresh again. Like when we first got born, when you first got born again, now you should have. We should have been very excited that God took us from death to life. That's an excitement. That's a... In fact, that should be the most excitement you have in your life. To find out that you were dead. The Lord says we're spiritually dead. And He is the life. So we give our heart to the Lord. Now we have life. What can be more exciting than that? I know at the beginning it says that He did these things. About the idols and all. But you know, when you're not growing studying and, and growing in the Lord and you kind of start living a, your Christian life coasting along you're not really growing but you're really not coming down but little by little yes you are when you're not growing that's not good little by little you start turning to your old ways 
so little that you don't even recognize that you're doing it. And this is what happened here. So he had to do what he had to do at the beginning about the idols. Verse 9, And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simeon. For they fell to him out of Israel in abundance when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. So they gathered themselves together at Jerusalem in the third month in the fifteenth year of the reign of Asa. And they offered unto the Lord the same time of the spoil which they had brought, seven hundred oxen and seven thousand sheep. These other cities here were Israel. And because Asa was walking with the Lord, and the Lord was blessing them, many of them crossed from, from uh, Israel, nor northern Israel, to come down to southern Israel, which was Judah. Remember, there was a split. Remember last week I told you there was a split. So northern Israel was called Israel, and the southern Israel was called Judah. So a lot of people were coming over from Israel down to Judah because they saw that Judah was walking with the Lord. Now let me just say something. You know, this man, this man of God, he faced a million men. There's times in our lives we can't stand up against one. Think about it. This man of God stood up against a million men because he knew God was on his side. We can't stand up sometimes against one man. Think about that. In verse 12, and they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. How do you get into the covenant with the Lord? You seek Him. You seek Him. You don't just go to church on Sunday. You don't just act like a Christian when you're on Christian when you're around Christians. You seek Him with all your heart and soul. That's what it says. This is also said in the New Testament. That we should give him. He wants all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind. That's being a Christian. When you live this way, that's being a Christian. Being a Christian is not, oh, I believe in God. No. Being a Christian is not, oh, I go to church every Sunday. No. Being a Christian is giving 100% of your heart and soul to the Lord. That's what being a Christian is. Verse 13, that whosoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. This is how serious we should be with our life, with the Lord. We live at home, we should be Christians. We're at at work, we should be Christians. We're Christians 24-7. Remember that. It's not a part-time job. We're Christians 24-7. We're always representing our Father, the Lord. We are ambassadors, like the New Testament says. In verse 14, And they swore unto the Lord with a loud voice, and with shouting, and with trumpets, and with cornets. Now for the religious, religious churches out there, getting loud or shouting, in the church oh that's not an orderly manner oh we shouldn't do that anytime you praise the lord with a loud voice or shouting anytime you do that that is being orderly that is an orderly manner that is moving in the spirit and if you're in a church that's, that does not allow you in fact they're telling you to quench the spirit i would find another church because i'm showing you right here it's biblical to make a loud noise unto, unto the Lord. He says even shouting. In the spirit. Now don't do it in the flesh. If you go to a church. And you see everybody else doing it. So you do it. No that, that's in the flesh. But if the Holy Spirit leads you to do this. Now we're saying this is biblical. Because it is. Verse 15. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath. For they had swore with their with all their heart and sought him with their whole desire and he was found of them and the Lord gave them rest round about they sought him with their whole desire 
I mean, that's what they lived for. Their desire was to live for the Lord. That's, that's what our desire is. When you become a born-again Christian, our desire, we want to live for the Lord. It's not like, uh, I got to do this, I got to do that because I'm a Christian now. Uh-uh. That's not coming from the heart. When it comes from the heart, it's a desire you want to do. Amen? And when you do that, the Lord gives, gives you rest. Verse 16. And also concerning Marka, the mother of Asa, the king, he removed her from being queen because she had made an idol in a grove. And Asa cut down her idol and stamped it and burnt it at the brook Kindrum. Now you may be saying, well, this is, this is not honoring your father and mother. I mean, this is his mother. How's, I mean, the Ten Commandments says to honor father and mother. Well, yes, it does say that. And it's the right thing to do. Only, only if they're following to God also. If they're doing something that's against the Lord, then no, they're wrong. You don't follow someone who's going to lead you in the wrong direction. You put the Lord before your parents. The first commandment is, I am the Lord, your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Now his mother had another God. So he put the Lord, he put God before his mother. And that's what we should do. The Lord says, unless he's first in your life, then he is not in your life. The second commandment is, you shall not make for yourself a graven image. Again, we should not have statues. This is against the Lord. It says it right here. It's in the Ten Commandments. So even with his mother, he put the Lord first. He did what he had to do with the statues. It said he stomped on it and burned it. Amen? That's what you do with idols. You don't praise them. You don't kneel before them. You get rid of them. Verse 17. But the high places were taken away out of Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was perfect all his days. Now this word perfect does not mean he was sinless. Perfect right here means he was with the Lord. His eyes, his heart was on the Lord. That made him perfect. Because he seeked the Lord. Not because he was sinless. Because we're not sinless until we go to be with the Lord or he comes and gets us. Verse 18. And he brought into the house of God the things that his father had dedicated. And that he himself had dedicated silver and gold in vessels. And there was no more war unto the five and thirty year of the reign of Asa. Now the Lord gave him peace for thirty-five years from having to fight any battles. Because why? Because he seeked the Lord. He did God's will. That's why. We want peace in our life? Seek the Lord. Do God's will. This is what we're learning from this. Seek the Lord. Follow him. And you will have peace. You will have rest. Chapter 16. In the sixth and thirtieth year of the reign of Asa, Basha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah to the intent that he might let none go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. This king, Basha, built a city called Ramah. It was a place where he could stop anyone from leaving or entering Judah. Because like I said before, people in Israel were leaving Israel to go down to Judah because Judah was following the Lord. So this king built a city to stop this from happening. He built him a little fortress so Israel wouldn't lose any more citizens. The king of Israel was losing people and he wanted to stop this. So he got this king to build a city so this so it could be stopped. Then in verse 2, Then Asa brought out silver and gold out of the treasures of the house of the Lord and the king's house, and sent to Ben-Hada, king of Syria, Syria, that dwelt at Damascus, saying, Now this is, this is what happened. Here's a man of God. Remember what it said in uh, 1 Kings 15, 11? Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. He's a man of God. Also in verse 14, Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord. Now, 
This is a man of God. Now, like I said, even after defeating a million men, totally dependent on the Lord, totally dependent on Him. And we're going to see what happens. In verse 3, we're going to see what happens. He says, There is a league between me and thee, as there was between my father and thy father. Behold, I have sent thee silver and gold. Go, break thy league with Basha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. And Benadiah hearkened unto king Asa, and set the captains of his armies against the city of Israel. And they smoked Anjan and Dad and Abelamin and all the story cities of Nepali. This man of God, who the Lord has been with, because he's been his eye, his eyes have been with the Lord. He's been following the Lord, obeying God, and the Lord has been taking care of him. Now, this happens. This king builds a city so nobody can come from Israel to Judah. Asa goes to this king and says, Hey, I got this gold and silver. If you'll turn against the king of Israel and stop this, you can have it. Now, King Asa was doing things in the flesh. This was his way of doing it. Remember, at the beginning of the teaching, our ways are not his ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He paid off this king of Syria to break the treaty he had with the king of Israel so he would leave them alone. And he did. This king did what Asa wanted. And then verse 5, And it came to pass, when Basha heard it, that he left off building of Ramah and left his work and let his work cease. Then Asa the king took all Judah and they carried away the stones of Raha and the timber thereof within Basha was building and he built therein therewith Kema and Mizbah. Basha had, had stopped building this fortress city. Asa took people and they got the stones that they were using to strengthen two of their own cities. This is what it says right here. So this man of God, all of a sudden, decided to do things his way. As we see, he did it the worldly way, in the flesh. But it did work. He did it in the flesh, but it did work. He paid this king, and this king did do what they so wanted him to do. That's the mistake we make a lot. If we do something our way, and it works... Then we say, it was from the Lord. You hear me? We do things our way. And it works. Then we tell people it was from the Lord. Verse 7. And at that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God, Therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thy hand. King Asa turned to a man instead of God. God had greater things for him, but he relied on a man, the king of Syria. In other words, he depended, he depended on a man. He depended on a man instead of God. When we depend on anything else besides God, we are wrong. We were putting this person before the Lord. Listen, listen to what the scripture is saying. He put this man before the Lord. He depended on this man instead of the Lord. Like I said, we do the same thing today. In many different ways, we do the same thing today. Now think, think within yourselves right now. You know, what are you doing right now that you're putting before God? Think about it. If you're relying on anything besides the Lord, you are putting whatever it is before God, and that is wrong. It says God would have given him the victory over both kings. He would have given him victory over both kings, the king of the king of Assyria and the king of Israel. He would have given him victory over both. If he would have just seeked the Lord like he'd been doing. If only he would have seeked the Lord, the Lord would have given him both. We don't know the blessings that we miss out on when we're not listening and obeying our Lord. Verse 8. 
Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubicans a huge host with every with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet, because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thy hand. I've told you many times before that Christians have a short memory when it comes to the Lord. He'll get us out of a problem, whatever the problem may be. He'll, he'll deliver us from it. And we praise Him for it. And then we go on and go on. And, and then we come across another problem. We forget what the Lord did for us on the other problem. Because we get this one over here and now we're panicking again. What am I going to do here? What am I going to do? If, we, if you would only read the Bible, you would know what to do. A lot of times we panic and we do things in the flesh. We do things the way the world does it. Remember, we're not of the world anymore. The prophet is reminding him how the Lord gave him all these victories over these enemies because he believed in the Lord. Verse 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro. Write this verse down somewhere. Write it down somewhere. This is a great verse. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly. Therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. It says right here, God is looking in the whole earth. In the whole earth, God is looking for those who are going to fully depend on him. So he can show himself to them and how strong he is. He's looking for people who will trust him this way. This is what this verse is saying. He's looking for people who will trust him totally. So he can show his greatness to them. He's looking for them. Which is not us. It's not us having to go look for him. Because he's there. We just need to receive him. And accept his words. And the word perfect doesn't mean sinless, like I said. It just means you have given the Lord 100% of your heart. That's what being perfect is. When you're living for the Lord. When you've, get him, when you've given Him all of your heart. Then he tells the king, You are a fool for not turning to your God. Because of that, things are going to be hard on you now. That's what he's telling them. Are you having problems in your life? Because you're, not, because you're not trusting in the Lord and you're trusting in man instead? Well, maybe that's why things are hard in your life. Because you are turning to man. Psalms 118.8 It is better to trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in a man. Did you hear that? It's better to trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in a man. This man is your pastor. This man is your doctor. This man is your teacher. This man is your father. Do not put man before God. Because believe it or not, your pastor is not perfect. I know a lot of people look at their preacher, their pastor as being a perfect man. No, he's not. Same thing with doctors. You put your confidence in a doctor that he can heal you. There's no greater healer than Jesus Christ. Your father man of God, even if he's a man of God, even like Asa did right here, he made a mistake, took his eyes off the Lord. Well, your father can do the same thing. So don't put man before God. Verse 10, Then Asa was wroth with the seer and put him in a prison house, for he was enraged with him because of this thing. And Asa repressed some of the people at the same time. This man of God, this man of God, was so angry that he took the prophet and some of the people and put them in prison. Now let me just say this real quick. Wives, if you're married to a Christian man and he's a godly man, praise God. But when he falls, when he makes a mistake for, the, for a moment, don't condemn him. Don't right away just say, oh, you're not a man of God. Because men of God, just like King David was a man of God, was a man after God's own heart. That's what the Bible says. He messed up. He messed up. But he was a man of God. He made a mistake. 
but he was a man of God. So wives, don't down your husband when they make mistakes because we're not perfect and that's not an excuse. We need to learn to walk with the Lord and to lead our family in the way the Lord wants us to. That's what being the head is, being the priest of the house. But we make mistakes. So wives, I'm just saying that because this man here, he made a mistake. Also, we need to see here that this prophet, a man of God, this prophet was doing the will of God. He was doing the will of God. God told him to go to Asa these things. And he told Asa. So this prophet was doing God's will. And what happened to him? He was put into prison for doing God's will. So these preachers that are out there who preach prosperity and if everything's good, that means you're, you're right with God. But if things go bad, it's because you're not walking with the Lord. That's a bunch of baloney. Read your Bible so you can see what the Word of God says. This was a man of God, a prophet, who did what God wanted him to do, and he was put into prison. Now, what are these preachers, what did they do with that? I don't know. Verse 11. And behold, the acts of Asa, first and last. Lo, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And Asa, in the thirtieth, in the thirty and ninth year of his reign, was diseased in his feet, until his disease was exceedingly great. Yet in his disease he sought not the Lord, but to the physician. Now, you, now you would think that Asa would have learned. Okay, from now on, I need to go to the Lord for whatever problem, whatever the problem, big or small. He should have learned. I need to go to the Lord. But did he learn? Did he repent and learn from what his mistake? I'm afraid not. Because right here, he got sick with his feet. He got sick. And instead of going to the Lord to heal him, he went to a doctor. Now let me say something about that. When you are sick, if you have a disease... Always, always go to the Lord first before you go to the doctor. Before you go get any medicine, go to the Lord. Because the Lord, you know, he, he just might heal you. Now, the Lord doesn't heal all the time, but I've, I have a teaching on that. Uh, the title is, Does God Still Heal? If anybody wants to know uh, more about that. But go to the Lord first. Always put Him first. Even on diseases, sicknesses, whatever you have, go to him first. Don't go to man first. Don't go to imperfect first before you go to perfect. You understand what I'm saying? Give God the opportunity to show his miracles, to show his greatness before you go to a man. He just might heal you. And if he does, praise God. That's going to show how great God is. But if you go straight to a man, to a doctor... Then you're denying him to show how powerful he is. Hope you understand what I'm saying. Nothing wrong with doctors. I'm not saying that. There's a lot of times the Lord may use a doctor. I'm just saying go to God first before you go to the doctor. Amen? Don't deny him performing a, mir a miracle with you or whoever you're praying for to get healed. Verse 13 and Asa slept with his fathers and died in the one and fortieth year of his reign. And they buried him in his own scripture, which he had made for him in the city of David, and laid him in the bed which was filled with sweet odors and different kinds of spices prepared by the Amoth carriers. <clears throat> Art. And they made a very great burning for him. Now we're learning from this lesson. First we learn we need spiritual discernment because there's preachers out there who are wolves and they give good sermons, but they're wolves. We learned this at the very beginning of the lesson. And we're learning that we need to obey God. Whether we understand what he's doing, whether we understand it or not, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. A lot of times we're not going to understand what God is doing. But we need to trust in Him. 
We need to trust in him that he knows what he's doing. That's why he's our God. That's why we made him our God. Because he is greater than us, much greater than us. Now, sometimes God has to take you, take you to the woodshed and give you a spanking when you don't listen to him. He has to chastise you, chastise us when we disobey him. That case of did. Now, listen to me. We have the choice. We can receive blessings like Asa did by keeping his eyes on the Lord. We can receive blessings or the Lord can spank us for not obeying him. So it's either blessings or chastisement. Which one do you want? It's not that hard of a choice to make. It's, this, it's the same thing as Okay, a person who's lost. Let's see. Do I want to accept God and go to heaven and live forever? Or do I want to go to hell with the devil and burn forever? That's the choice. That's the choice everybody has to make. Now, this is the same thing right here. Do, do I want to obey God and receive blessings and rewards? Or do I want to be getting spankings all the time for disobeying them? It's up to us. He's given us a free will. It's up to us. We make the choice. I pray that you would choose God's way. Like I said, even though you don't understand it, choose His way.